And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to recognize and celebrate our returning distinguished graduates, escorted by a cadet from each of the distinguished graduates graduating squadron. Ladies and gentlemen, General Ronald Fogelman, class of 1963 and former Chief of Staff of the Air Force, a 2001 distinguished graduate, escorted tonight by Cadet First Class Jason Holmes from Cadet Squadron 13. Ladies and gentlemen, General Ronald Yates, class of 1960, a 2004 distinguished graduate, escorted by Cadet Third Class Ryan Bourne. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Frederick Gregory, class of 1964, a 2004 distinguished graduate, escorted by Cadet Second Class Michaela Demapi from Cadet Squadron 18. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant General Robert Beckel, class of 1959, a 2006 distinguished graduate, escorted by Cadet Second Class Sarah Cook from Cadet Squadron 12. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Major General Edward Meckenbeyer, class of 1964, a 2006 distinguished graduate, escorted by Cadet Fourth Classman Joseph Toronto from Squadron 22. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant General Urban Rocky, the class of 1962, a 2007 distinguished graduate, escorted by Cadet First Class Caleb Ringe from Cadet Squadron 21. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. John Martinson, class of 1970, a 2008 distinguished graduate, escorted tonight by Cadet Second Class Joshua Kaus from Cadet Squadron 24. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Max James, class of 1964, a 2010 distinguished graduate, escorted by Cadet Second Class Matthew Green from Cadet Squadron 4. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Brigadier General Ruben Cabero, class of 1961, a 2011 distinguished graduate, escorted by Cadet Third Classman Dennis Callahan from Cadet Squadron 15. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, 
Mr. Richard McCon, class of 1966, a 2011 distinguished graduate, escorted by Cadet First Class Candace Roberts from Cadet Squadron 22. Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant General Marcus Anderson, class of 1961, a 2012 distinguished graduate, escorted tonight by Cadet Third Class Tyler Wright from Squadron 8. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Edward Legacy, class of 1967, a 2012 distinguished graduate, escorted tonight by Cadet Fourth Classman Jonathan Nash of Cadet Squadron 6. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bart Holliday, class of 1965, a 2013 distinguished graduate, escorted by Cadet First Class Eric Rogers from Cadet Squadron 21. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Thomas Eller, Class of 1961, a 2014 distinguished graduate, escorted tonight by Cadet First Class Nicholas Francoeur from Cadet Squadron 3. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, General Kevin Chilton, Class of 1976, a 2014 distinguished graduate, escorted tonight by Cadet Second Class Sarah Gingridge from Cadet Squadron 5. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, General Gregory Martin, Class of 1970, a 2015 distinguished graduate, escorted tonight by Cadet Second Class Preston Rimsey from Cadet Squadron 15. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Paul Madeira, Class of 1978, a 2015 distinguished graduate, escorted by Cadet Fourth Classman Gabriel Calvo from Squadron 40. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, General Charles Holland, Class of 1968, a 2016 distinguished graduate Escorted tonight by Cadet Second Class Matt Finley from Cadet Squadron 21. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. David Yost, Class of 1969, a 2016 distinguished graduate, escorted tonight by Cadet Second Class Abigail Misch from Cadet Squadron 13. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Colonel Gary Payton, class of 1971, a 2016 distinguished graduate, escorted tonight from Cadet Fourth Classman Jackson Harris from Cadet Squadron 2.
And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to present this year's Distinguished Graduate Honorees, who will be joining the ranks of 34 previously recognized United States Air Force Academy Distinguished Graduates. Mr. John Fox, class of 1963, a 2017 distinguished graduate, escorted by Cadet First Class Josiah Williams from Cadet Squadron 4. Mr. Alan McCarter, class of 1964, a 2017 distinguished graduate, escorted by Cadet First Class Anya Wallace from Cadet Squadron 1. And General Stephen Lorenz, the class of 1973, a 2017 distinguished graduate, Escorted tonight by Cadet Fourth Classman Greg Barry of Cadet Squadron 15. And now, in honor of these distinguished leaders of character and excellence, the United States Air Force Academy Band, Vector Brass, will perform America the Beautiful. And now, ladies and gentlemen, to honor our nation's flag and all our military members, airmen, soldiers, sailors, Marines, and Coast Guardsmen who are defending freedom at home and around the world, please rise as Senior Airman Jamie Teachner leads us in the singing of our national anthem. Say, can you see by the dawn's early light 
What so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof to the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave. O'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. The night began as a, there was a typical call shift for me. But, I mean, around 9 o'clock, all that changed. We started getting the notifications of the shootings and the police officers that were being transported to our hospital. Multiple gunshot is something that we deal with quite frequently. But this incident clearly was different than others because there were officers that were involved. There was this Black Lives Matter protest. There was the antecedent days of black men dying at the hands of police officers. So there are a lot of extra details that change the whole dynamic of the situation. I treated all seven of the officers that came to, that came to our trauma center. The man in charge of Parkland's trauma center Thursday night, Surgeon Brian Williams, told us he has conflicted feelings since that horrible night. And I think about it every day, that I was unable to save those cops when they came here that night. This killing, it has to stop. Black men dying and being forgotten, people retaliating against the people that are sworn to defend us, we have to come together and end all this. You need to really make an effort to put yourself in the shoes of the other person and see how they feel. Because how they feel is legitimate. If you even get past that, you need to be able to discuss that. You know, we, have, we do a lot of talk about diversity, but diversity doesn't equal understanding. You, know, you gotta think, this, this one shooter who killed these police officers the ripple effects of what he's done has impacted you know, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people. You may not realize it, but it impacts you. So that's why I feel, you know, we are, we are all in this together. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to introduce tonight's Master of Ceremonies, the Academy Dean of Faculty, Brigadier General Andrew Armacos, the 10th Dean of the Academy's 64-year history. What a great way to begin this evening, seeing the great inspiration from, from, uh, from these videos uh, just across the board, the great images of our great country and this, the heroic work of, uh, of Brian Williams. And then to see the, uh, our distinguished graduates from years past and our nominees from this year to come down the stairs. I mean, what a great way to, to bring this night to life. And look at this place. How many people have seen this ballroom look so great? So how about a round of applause for the people who have set it up? 
And, and what a great day today with uh, the distinguished graduates being celebrated in front of the entire cadet wing. Just a great way to honor them and to really give a vision to our cadets about what lays ahead of them and, and the things that our institution, our Air Force Academy, gives them as they go forth to begin their careers. So what a great day. And then if we look at this place, 450 people, I understand, are in this room. It's never been so large, which is why we moved uh, to this facility. And in fact, we're so packed in here. I think uh, the layout, uh, Table 19, I think, has given themselves a new name. I think they're called Under the Stairwell. <laughs> Table 19, a shout out to Table 19. They will be singing later on in today's show. <laughs> and uh, I can say, um, Kathy and I have had some recent experiences that uh, make speaking to 450 people actually a really easy thing. So I'll tell you more about that as we get closer to the 4th of July. So I, uh, it's a, a really amazing opportunity to come up here and speak. I'll tell you why in a minute. But if you think about a little trivia, let me ask you this question. What do General Matthew Ridgway, Bobby Mercer, and Jay Leno all have in common? Well, they all replaced living legends, and they had huge shoes to fill. Think about General Ridgway. He took over for General Douglas MacArthur. What about Bobby Mercer? He replaced Mickey Mantle in center field for the Yankees. And how about Jay Leno? He took over for Johnny Carson on The Tonight Show. And here I am, <laughs> trying to replace the incomparable Gary Howe. <laughs> and I'm really hoping that by the end of the night, Gary isn't heard to say, man, I really need to return. <laughs> so Gary, we salute you on your service to the academy and to the graduate community throughout these years, your wisdom, your humor, your creativity are all appreciated by every single person in this room. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Mr. Gary Howe. All right, no spotlight, he's over at table eight. But additionally, the superintendent and our athletic director, Jim Knowlton, have prepared a special artifact for Gary. And this is an official Falcon name tag that's on the back of uniforms. It says, how? And according to Jim, you haven't actually arrived until you have one of these Falcon uniform items. So over in the corner, you'll see the superintendent and Jim Knowlton uh, presenting this artifact, this gift, to Gary Howe. How about a round of applause? And for fans of Founders Day, you'll recall Gary's amazing displays of talent as a crooner. And so you're wondering, is Armacost actually going to sing tonight? And the answer is, probably not. You wouldn't want that to happen. But when the MC Replacement Search Committee was looking for talent, they came to me and they asked, hey, do you have any special talents? And you know, I told them, hey, I'm an academic. I have no talents. However, I could read excerpts from my dissertation on optimization methods for log logistics planning. Or perhaps I could do a 15 minute review of the changes to the core curriculum. <laughs> All I got were blank stares, just like from you. Instead, I said, hey, I, I, I can also, this is a strange talent. I've never seen anybody who can do this. I can play tunes on my thumbs. You've seen people do this. Right? I can actually play tunes. And so for, for fans of the 1980s icon, George Zamfir, who played the magic pan flute, Virginia, I, I see you're a fan. You'll recall that his, his mainstay was Chariots of Fire. <clears throat> Here we go. <coughs> I hope it picked up, picks up on the microphone. Oh. There we 
we go. Well done. You remember the movie. I still got blank stares from them. So it wasn't sufficient. So then I realized I used to dabble in juggling. So how about this? I happened to bring three apples with me. So some old talents might impress these guys. And I thought, hey, let's give it a shot. So now, most of you don't realize this. A little known fact about Andy Armacost is before I joined the Air Force, I served as a professional juggler. No kidding. I was the heavy object guy. I was the baseball bats and bowling balls. I had a friend who did fire, flaming clubs. And I had another friend who did sharp objects. And so Kathy has dissuaded me from doing this. But I always was envious of the knife guy. So from the Armacost kitchen. Here we go. I need your help. I need inspiration. I'm going to ask you to count to three along with me. All right? Here we go. Wait. One, two, three. Three weeks ago, my wife and I were actually preparing for a trip to Los Angeles. And Kathy came home and said, honey, I got you tickets on The Price is Right. That was exciting. <laughs> Tune in on the 4th of July. All right, here we go. I need a little more room for this one. go. Those are my talents. <laughs> I would hope to have some more. But face it, I will never replace Gary Howe. I think we can all agree to that. And uh, I just, um, in all seriousness, I was ecstatic to have this opportunity to MC this evening. And it was really for four very important reasons. Um, the first three are tonight's award winners. You might not know this, but I have connections in some way to all three. Uh, John Fox and I have worked very closely together over the last four and a half years on our Academic Stewardship Committee, and I appreciate his advice and all the support he's provided the academic mission at the Air Force Academy. General Steve Lorenz and I have known each other for even longer, and he's been an, an ardent supporter for, for our academic programs as well. And uh, his mentorship and friendship is so meaningful to me and to Kathy as well. And then Mr. McArthur, um, we, uh, we have a connection through the class of 1964. Kathy's father is a member of the class of 64 and a classmate of Mr. McArthur. So it's great. Those are my three connections. And you might say, well, what's the fourth? Well, the fourth is, um, um, you know, I jumped at the chance to, to take this MC gig because uh, Marty Marcalongo told me, Hey, ROTC graduate, the, the only way you're getting in the door is if we put you to work. <laughs> so in all seriousness, um, we welcome each of you uh, to Founders Day 2018. Uh, feel free to partake in your salads while we introduce a few of our special guests. This evening, we have with us 32 generals, including six four stars, one former chief of staff of the Air Force, 20 distinguished graduates, with three more awaiting installation tonight. And I'm serious when I said, please start your salads. Everybody's still staring at me. Enjoy. <laughs> we have three astronauts. And we have two former prisoners of war. And allow me now to introduce some of our distinguished guests in the audience. The co-hosts for tonight's event are Lieutenant General Jay Silveria, class of 1985, the 20th 
superintendent of the U.S. Air Force Academy, and his wife, Virginia. And the president and CEO of the Association of Graduates, Mr. Marty Marcolongo, class of 1988. The Academy's senior staff in attendance includes the Commandant of Cadets, Brigadier General Kristen Goodwin, class of 1993, and her wife, Kelly. The Air Force Academy Director of Athletics, Mr. Jim Knowlton, U.S. Military Academy, class of 1982, and his wife, Corey. Good job, Jim. You got a woo-woo. Nice. Representing the three organizations that call Doolittle Hall their home. The board chair of the Association of Graduates, Kathy McLean, class of 1982, and her husband, Mark. The board chair for the USAFA Endowment, Jack Kutra, class of 1978. And the President and CEO of the USAFA Endowment, Lieutenant General retired Mike Gould, class of 1976, and his wife Paula. And next, the President of the Falcon Foundation, the Lord of Loquaciousness, the Wizard of Words, the Admiral of Alliteration, the Paragon of Parachuting, Lieutenant General Retired Jay Kelly, class of 1964. And the lady who lights up his solar panels, his wife Sook. <laughs> Representing the additional nonprofits who support so generously our Air Force Academy, Dr. Nancy Hickson, Chief Executive Officer of the Air Force Academy Athletic Corporation, and her husband Jeff. And Mr. Mick Ertle, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of the Academy Research and Development Institute, and his wife, Tamara. <laughs> Would members of the Board of Directors for the Association of Graduates, the USAFA Endowment, the Falcon Foundation, ARDI, the AFAC, Friends of the Library, and the Air Force Academy Foundation please stand and be recognized. How about a round of applause? And I would certainly be remiss, and I would get in a lot of trouble if I did not abuse my power as tonight's MC at least once this evening to recognize my own wonderful and darling wife, Kathy. And with us this, night, this evening are several former permanent professors who have come here to celebrate the accomplishments of our distinguished graduates. How about a round of applause? And most importantly, we honor our distinguished graduates that will be installed this evening. Mr. John Fox, class of 1963, and his wife, Sandy. <laughs> Mr. Alan McCarter, class of 1964, and his wife, Gracie. <laughs> and General Retired Steve Lorenz, class of 1973, and his wife, Leslie. And with them, of course, our family members, friends, and classmates. We welcome you all. Hi, my name is Kelly Latimer, and I'm a 1987 graduate of the Air Force Academy. And we're here in the Faith Hangar at Virgin Galactic in Mojave, California. At Virgin Galactic, in the Flight Ops Department, there are seven test pilots. Uh, three of us are actually Academy graduates. Um, we come from a variety of backgrounds. We have one uh, RAF pilot, Dave McKay, he's our chief pilot. Um, we have uh, two Marines, both uh, um, Mark Stuckey and CJ Sturkow. CJ was also a prior shuttle astronaut. Um, Forger came to us from 
scale composites where he's got the most experience of anybody in the uh, um, Space Ship 2 and the White Knight 2 flying. We've also got Todd Erickson who uh, came to us after being the uh, uh, Flight Test Center Chief of uh, Safety. He's an F-16 pilot from the Air Force, also a test pilot. And uh, Nicola Pachile, who is an Italian test pilot and he was an instructor here at the uh, Mojave International Test Pilot School and uh, came to us from that job. And I came uh, from flying in the Air Force, NASA, and Boeing. I recently became one of the test pilots for Virgin Galactic, and behind me you see the White Knight 2 aircraft. I just got qualified to fly that. Mike Masucci, who calls the White Knight his uh, four-engine U-2, because he says it flies a lot like the U-2, so he's a highly experienced U-2 and uh, F-16 test pilot from the Air Force, also part of our flight ops cadre. And Such and I were actually in the same uh, squadron at the Academy for one year. <laughs> and looking forward in the future to flying Spaceship 2 um, and also our uh, 747 Launcher 1 platform. It's an exciting time to be part of Virgin Galactic. There's a lot going on in both the uh, human and satellite access to space. And uh, I'm just looking forward to the next couple years of being uh, pretty incredible. Ladies and gentlemen, and now please welcome the 20th Superintendent of the United States Air Force Academy, Lieutenant General Jay Silveria, class of 1985. Thank you. Uh, what a wonderful evening. Uh, it's such an honor to be among so many of these distinguished grads that in so many ways have been examples, mentors, have been, uh, and I've worked for probably half of them. So uh, it's, uh, it's certainly great to be here tonight. I've been the superintendent now for eight months, and it's been flying by. I have to tell you that it's no the easiest job so far that I've ever had in the United States Air Force because everybody is quick to tell me how I should do my job. So all I need to do is follow all of these graduates what I need to do. So Stand I tell you the best three. part about the job though is that I've had an opportunity to go around the country and meet so many members yes. of our association, yes. graduate chapters, parents groups, partners, supporters, cadets in, in their hometowns. And it's been an inspiration to see how wide the reach of our Air Force Academy is and the enthusiasm of the greater USAFA community. Most of those engagements so far, and they've ranged from tables inside Uber in San Francisco to plantation homes in, Sa in South Carolina to the 52nd floor of an office building in New York City to a hangar in Indianapolis, they've been amazing experiences. But most of them have been focused on our current state our vision and our trajectory, but tonight is about an opportunity for us to reflect on our roots of this community and recognize what our academy set in place in the beginning. It allows us a chance to celebrate those roots and celebrate what those before us did and identify where we came from and learn from that history. And I have to tell you, the first thing as a superintendent, I'm stepping right straight back to the beginning of General Harmon who was 5'7 and 140 pounds. <laughs> Sadly, the camera didn't follow you. I'll, I'll do that again later. Our academy started out at the end of the Korean War, and our graduates have been instrumental through every conflict when called on by our nation. The Vietnam War, the Cold War, Gulf War, 9-11, and I recently talked to my classmate who is serving as the Air Component Commander in the Middle East and all the graduates that are serving tonight that are keeping us safe and fighting the war today. We've grown from 306 cadets to we have over 4,000 now that are, we have over 4,000 in the cadet wing. And think about this. They studied lunar soil in the 60s. Today we have students that are researching and I will read microstructures of new carbon fiber polymer composite using graph theory. <laughs> Andy will fill you in a little bit later. <laughs> These cadets are launching and controlling satellites here at the academy. These cadets are flying RPAs and controlling them. These cadets are functioning in the cyber domain and teaching the rest of the Air Force how we should be doing business in those domains. Areas that most of us never would have envisioned. They are leading us in so many ways. 
Even though our world, our nation, our Air Force has changed over those years, our mission here at the Academy has not. We're making lieutenants that are lethal lieutenants. They're innovative, they're warriors, and they have impeccable character. And with an external environment that is constantly changing, we have well, to be out in front Marty's how we produce our next Air Force leaders. We produce these lethal second lieutenants, and we do it with unbelievable instructors, coaches, AOCs, faculty, staff, and it's unbelievable to watch them do their work every single day. There are so many groundbreaking things that are going on at the Academy today. I'm, uh, I am honored to be the steward of that for the next number of years. But CyberWorks, as we be begin to look forward to that, our planetarium is in, is, uh, is in renovation. The hockey team this year made, made national level news. Our soccer team had remarkable success this year. And I can go on and on with all of the good news stories that happened. And it's not just in those athletic teams. It's in the clubs. It's in the cadet wings. It's everywhere that cadets have an opportunity to touch something. They make a remarkable impact. Please take the time tonight to reconnect with so many old friends, reminisce about the good old days, tell those old stories. I will remind you that nothing ruins a good war story like an eyewitness, but please tell those stories anyway. <laughs> They're great stories. They're great ways for you to find, find ways to, to recall the past, but then to find ways to take those stories so that they can be part of our current story. Thank you. Rockport, Texas was ground zero for Hurricane Harvey. For 47 years, nothing hit us, but it did this time. Well, the city of Rockport, Texas is right in Harvey's path and is getting hit hard. Tonight, along the Texas Gulf Coast, utter devastation. In the town of Rockport, entire blocks are decimated. What I'm concerned about is the number of businesses that are not going to return. This is the Rockport Harbor. It is the center of my economy, the Texas State Maritime Museum right there. It took a significant amount of damage. We do not know when it's going to open again. The Rockport Center for the Arts, it is a total loss. Every apartment building in town, none are occupiable today. Everybody that lived in those apartments worked somewhere. And if I have no place for them to live, I'm gonna end up losing the businesses that they were supporting uh, before the storm hit. This area, about probably 40 to 45 percent, took major damage, maybe to the point of being completely destroyed. So we're now at the very front end of what I will call the rebuilding process. Uh, a lot of work still needs to be done, and I've emphasized to, to, the, to the staff of the city, the city council, and to anybody else who will listen, this is not a sprint, this is a marathon. This is going to take a long time. We've had tremendous unity in the community by and large to focus on that long-term goal of rebuilding this community and making it stronger than it was. You try to take the small steps that are on the path toward the mission goal and you do a little bit each day to improve the lives of your citizens and you try to do that every day. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor now, would you please join me in welcoming the President and CEO of the Association of Graduates, Mr. Marty Marcalongo, Class of 1988. Well, good evening, everyone. Last June, I was only a few days from starting as a CEO when the Class of 2021 arrived. Other than making me feel old, it made me think back 33 years when I was preparing to come to the Academy. I was listening to Springsteen. I was watching movies like Footloose, the original, and Ghostbusters, the original. <laughs> That's for the cadets, okay. <laughs> but honestly, most of my time was spent wondering, which I think many people thought, will I be able to make it through the Academy? The only long-term thinking I was making at that point was, 
I hope to be an Air Force officer and maybe I'd be able to get into the space program. Now for someone like me, the fourth of five children, growing up in a lower middle class family, it seemed very, very improbable. But at the same time, my parents were busy raising five children on a DJ salary, and if you can believe it, a Bell telephone operator salary, trying to deliver a better life for us. Now to their thinking, it must have been an Air Force officer, an astronaut, it must have seemed ludicrous. But they didn't discourage me. For you see, they raised us to believe that America was a place where your willingness to work hard truly mattered of what you could make of yourself. So instead, fortunately, they encouraged me. And at the same time, they tried to instill in me, as all, all parents do, values. And what they tried to instill in me were, I mean, they're very simple. One, tell the truth. Two, your word and your handshake are your bond. And I didn't have this in the script, but three, uh, before we leave the house on Saturday night, they'd say, remember your Mark Longo, even though no one can pronounce it. <laughs> because the police sure can. And the, sorry, Bob. Okay. And the, repetitive, and the repetitive theme, serving others is a requirement, not an option. So what did that look like to a young boy in Jersey? Well, imagine, I'll take it back to the 70s. It's a brutal winter on the East Coast. You wake up in the morning, you see snow on the ground. You turn on that AM radio, and you hear the words, school is canceled. Oh, the sheer bliss. But to us, it was time to make some snow shoveling cash. So my brother would grab the good snow shovel, and I'd grab the one with the broken blade, because I was the younger brother, and we'd get ready to hit the streets. But before we were allowed to go, my parents would stop us and say, what? Shovel the family walk first. But not just that. They'd say, you have to do the De Havens across the street, the boils to the right, the hollerings to the left, and then there's the widow who lives above the newspaper. You have to do the two stories of stairs for her. And if we ever dared to take a nickel, look out, because spanking was still in vogue back then. <laughs> so we were taught early on service before self. Now, of course, we had the three core values here at the Academy and the Air Force, integrity, service, excellence. But my challenge to you and to me in 2018 is to focus the AOG and the grad community on the idea of a lifetime of service. You might say, well, why? Aren't the other two important? Well, of course they are. But I would say, in my opinion, it, uh, in a good way, they get center stage 24 seven. We built all the programs at the academy around integrity, even building a building to teach cadets about honor and integrity. So it's top of mind every day. Now for excellence, well, we think about it every day. We're compelled to do it. Our rankings, our academics, our PFTs, our assignments are all tied to the amount of work and the amount of excellence we put in every day. If we're excellent, it yields opportunities. So we do it, but service, well, we know we're supposed to put the Air Force and the nation before ourselves. But my challenge for 2018 and beyond is that we need to elevate service in our minds to something that is intentional daily, weekly, monthly. It does, just doesn't happen while we're wearing the uniform. It's something we must add to the equation for a lifetime, whether we're 22 or 102. I would put to you that America needs us more today than ever before because we have a problem. We're a connected country connected by technology, but we're isolated. As we speak, my grade school friends, I'm not kidding, are linking up on Facebook Messenger, trying to put together a party this fall. And I haven't seen or talked to them in almost 40 years. But at the same time, in today's connected world, people are dying of loneliness. We have stronger internet connections, but weaker personal connections. So what's the solution? We need to develop strong connections to each other. How, why well, I would put to you, selfless service, service is a way to do it. I challenge you there's no finish line for an academy graduate. There should be no finish line for anyone who enjoys the freedom and opportunity that America gives them. But if you're an academy graduate, I want to speak to you grad to grad. <laughs> is that you? Is that, oh my gosh. Is that you, Gary? Sorry. <laughs> okay. So speak grad to grad. The people of the United States didn't choose you from 10,000 applicants so you could be a cadet. They didn't choose you from 10,000 people so you could say, I'm an Air Force officer. They chose you because you had the potential to become a leader of character for the nation. The potential to become a leader of character for the nation. A servant leader for a lifetime. 
Let me put it this way. At the Air Force Academy, you learned a lot about the gifts you have and the good purposes you can serve. They're yours to embrace. They're yours to share. And I think you've all heard the quote, one person can change the world. But most people hear that and say, eh, sure, someone else may be able to change the world, but not someone like me. To those people, I say, sure, one person may not be able to change the world, but you can change the world for one. And who knows, maybe, the, uh, excuse me, and who knows, maybe you will change the world, or the person you help may change the world. So here's my hope, other than not crying. At the, <laughs> at the end of the evening, you'll get home, take off the uncomfortable clothes, get a good night's sleep, and you'll wake up fresh tomorrow. You'll think back on this evening, and maybe, just maybe, you'll recommit to serve others with no finish line. It's the Academy thing to do. It's the American thing to do. Thank you. So our realtor had said, I just want you guys to look at one more piece of property. And we came out here to look at 47 acre maple syrup farm that sleeps 14 people, which it was Matt and I, so we weren't sure what we were gonna do with that. April of uh, 2011, when I got the call from a friend of mine who said that a fellow classmate, Dave Broder, had been shot and killed in Kabul. And then two months later, in June of 2011, is when uh, Michaela's good friend, her husband, was killed in an F-16 crash. Having lost some of our really good friends um, and being at those memorial services, as a friend sitting around that room looking at all of our classmates, realizing it could have been any one of us, um, we just felt that we needed to do something. I told Michaela that for me it was very healing to be up here and just find time to relax and to get together with friends and family, whether we talk about Eric or we don't, and we just spend a day out on the boat. Either way, that friendship and that fellowship is what helped me. And that's when the light bulb turned on and we said, that's why Holbrook Farms is here. We just had such a great outpouring from the survivors. We had a wait list immediately of women that wanted to come. We didn't realize how much need there was out there. And so uh, when word started getting out from the first five guests, to the 13 we had last year. Um, word has spread faster than we expected. I feel like our life mission is to serve those who serve. Find a way to give back to those that are supporting our country and those that have made the ultimate sacrifice. So folks with us tonight, so that you know, our 32 members of the cadet wing Welcome to our celebration of the Long Blue Line. Graduates and guests, please offer a round of applause for the cadets who are here with us and who's, in whose hands our heritage rests. And with that, we invite you to enjoy the camaraderie, camaraderie of old grads, of young cadets, of young grads, of classmates, and of friends. We expect great things tonight, and especially a great dinner. Bon appetit, dinner is served.
It is a very great honor to call upon the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, General Nathan F. Twining. General Twining. General Harmon, Secretary Talbot, distinguished guests, men of the Air Force Academy, and visitors. This is really a proud day for all of us. Institutions such as ours are not built overnight. We must be patient and not press too hard for early fulfillment of our dream. Up until now, the interest of the nation has centered upon the location of the Air Academy, its architecture, and its surroundings. From today on, however, the nation's interest will be on you cadet and those who follow you. The Air Force Academy is not really important in itself. What is important is the product of the Air Academy. The graduates will be the measure of its success. This is why we must have a very special kind of self-discipline. A single pilot may be alone, thousands of miles from home, hundreds of miles from any control or supervision. If the going is rough, no one can see him if he falters except himself. Both the big things and the little things you do will establish traditions and customs at this great school. You may find this a mixed blessing because the eyes of the nation and especially the eyes of everybody in the Air Force are going to be on you. Not only while you're a cadet, but after you graduate. Everybody will be looking over your shoulder and they will be critical for they have a right to expect great things. Expecting great things just seems to be at the heart of the Air Force Academy and the cadet experience. That's the spirit of the Academy and for me, mountaineering always does that. Because until Mount Everest, there was always some other level of greatness I could try to reach. We aim to go to, go to great heights. We aim to do great things and now I'm at 29,000 feet. There's nothing higher that I can climb. The only way I can go up from here is to strap on a jet. And that's one reason I thought it was appropriate to just do push-ups, just to show that 29,000 feet isn't the end. Uh, we can do a PT test up here. Um, airmen aren't daunted, we're not scared, we're not um, put back by altitude. In fact, that's what we crave. That's what's in the DNA of the Air Force. That's what makes us do great things, is wanting to go higher, to go faster. Now that our Air Force team has made it up Mount Everest, what does greatness look like from here? And I think it's developing the next generation of military mountaineers. That's my passion for being here at the Air Force Academy, is to inspire the cadets to, to take what we've given them and take it 10 steps further, to, to blow away all the records we've ever set. That's the attitude I want them to have, that craving for being the best and for doing things that no one thought was possible. Most of my life, I expected to accomplish great things. It sort of meant that to me. This is a completely different culture. This is Africa. Greatness largely is being patient and understanding the community that I'm in and what's useful for them. And I find that doing the work here with Peace Corps and working with the people here in Namibia, I can bring to bear a lot of the experience that I have in a way that's really useful for people in a different way than happens in the United States. Anything that I can do to help them move themselves ahead makes it worth me getting up every morning. And that's why I'm here. You'll be surprised at what you can achieve uh, by expecting great things of yourself and of your comrades in arms and, and their families. They are very glad to know, especially those that die away from the academy and they're buried back here, that there is a, uh, an Air Force family that they are part of. I hope that uh, they realize that they continue to be part of a larger family and that they realize they can depend and rely upon that family for not only sympathy and prayers, but action where action is necessary. And I, I will tell you that I, I get far more out of participating in these services uh, than I give to them. Uh, I'm always amazed at some of the stories that are told, uh, some of the dedication that is displayed. I hope that they, they go away feeling that they're loved by their Air Force family. The Air Force Academy taught us to expect the very best that we can give. 
the core values of a company, what we try to accomplish and achieve, the level of support we want to give a customer, stems from the leadership. We make these robots that are fun to play with, but also help kids learn coding, engineering, mathematics. These are things that kids are going to need to learn to be successful in the job market 20, 30 years from now. When you see the children smile, you see the light bulb go off where they totally grasp a, a concept that would be difficult to just explain on a whiteboard, that's gold. It's not only good business, but it's, it's good for feeding your purpose in life. The Academy is designed to help you into those areas that maybe you're uncomfortable with. So whether it's starting your own company or whether it's entering into the foster care world, you always have to expect great things from yourself. And I think that that's part of the thing that Robin and I have recognized as a family, is we can achieve great things if we're willing to serve others and if we're willing to give back to our community. Uh, in expecting great things, we opened our home to uh, 46 children. It doesn't necessarily have to be something that's going to you know, shatter the world because even some of the ordinary achievements lead to great things. Expecting great things really was planted into me while I was at the Air Force Academy. But it also taught me the importance of giving back. My goal in life is trying to help as many people as I possibly can. Shirley Chisholm, she had a quote said, service is the rent we pay for the privilege of living on earth. And that drives me, it really does. I want to make a life by helping other people. That's what the Air Force Academy instilled in me. And if we lived in a world where we had more people that had that mindset, the world would be in such a much greater place. So I'm the sixth Air Force amputee to return to flying. There are five others and within the first two or three days in the hospital, all five of them called me. So I always felt like I was part of the long blue line. That is hands down true. It just brought it all to the forefront and showed me what does that actually look like practically. And it looks like so many people bringing you food and blankets and stuff in the hospital and visiting you. And that just blew me away, honestly blew me away. And so it made me have so much more commitment and loyalty to this mission and how we care about people. And I'm just so happy to be alive. I'm so happy to be back to my job, back to what I love in the Air Force, in this community. And that has taught me just to expect great things for myself and others. We're all proud for somewhat different reasons. So always remember, it is your school. And it will always be your school as long as you live. We have great hope and confidence in each of you. Only you, the cadets, can make it a great school. Thank you and good luck.
Well, my early life was um, mostly spent in Richland, Washington. It's a small town in southeast Washington. And um, I don't know, I was a kind of a curious kid. I, I liked to take things apart. Sometimes I could put them back together again. And I actually, for most of my youth, thought I wanted to go to the Naval Academy. And uh, that was what I was planning to do. And I applied to go to the Naval Academy in my senior year in high school. The Naval Academy did not choose me that year. So I went off to the University of Washington for a year to improve my English skills. And uh, the next year, I heard about this new uh, school called the Air Force Academy. And I thought, gee, I, maybe I ought to apply there too. Well, lo and behold, uh, I was selected for both the Naval Academy and the Air Force Academy. And what I realized finally is there wasn't a lot of skiing near Annapolis, I didn't think, but I remembered that Colorado probably had some pretty good mountains. And so um, I did choose the Air Force Academy and I'm very glad I did because of course, for me, it's made all the difference. Unfortunately, my roommate uh, that I was paired with in that basic cadet summer was, uh, had a, a nervous breakdown, and he left the academy. My flight commander, then cadet Ron Yates, he said, we do not have a replacement roommate for you. Uh, this is about a third of the way through basic that summer, are you gonna be okay alone? And I said, well, sir, I think I probably am. And what that did for me is it gave me uh, a lot of confidence. The fact that he had confidence in me, I should have confidence that I can get through this. And that, that was a, an important point for me. Later in, in my uh, business career, all of those lessons, how to build a team, leadership, how to get people motivated to do something, I'm not sure I could have ever achieved that or had that at a civilian university, and um, certainly not with the mentors that I had at the Air Force Academy who helped me through some of those ups and downs that one has at the Academy. My Air Force career uh, started out, I of course went to pilot training and then uh, I was uh, able to become a T-38 instructor pilot, went to Laughlin Air Force Base. I also devised this course, uh, Applied Aerodynamics, it was part of the curriculum, but I kind of put my own stamp, I think, on the course and I think it was helpful to our student pilots to learn about how an airplane flies, why it flies, some of the problems they may encounter in flight. And so that was a, a great period of my life. At that point, I left the Air Force. Um, I think I realized that probably my skills were better suited perhaps in the business world. Shortly thereafter, um, my sister, introduced me to a couple of Shell engineers that also were thinking of leaving Shell, but they said, well, we need an expert finance person. And of course, I raised my hand and I said, well, I'm that person. And over the next uh, 10 to 15 years, we built this company. We had 50 million in sales by the end of that period. and. Um, I sort of at that point wanted to uh, do my own thing, and, but I liked the business we were in. So uh, I left our company, uh, Western Gas Processors, and I started my own company uh, called Mark West Energy Partners. And uh, Mark West then, of course, was something I stayed with for the next 20 years. Uh, we built that company and eventually uh, went public and uh, I finally retired as uh, chairman of the company in 2009 
But by then, uh, or shortly thereafter, we, we reached uh, a market value on the New York Stock Exchange of around $10 billion. So I was very uh, gratified that we had that success and uh, really enjoyed uh, all my career there as well. We, we just love uh, being with this little coffee company. The coffee business in Hawaii is a lot of fun. It's, uh, we have a farm and then we have two uh, retail stores. Just working with the local farmers and our own farm and uh, going through the ups and downs of farming and then uh, the coffee is wonderful. Um, in fact, I wish everybody would start drinking it. Well, I have three children and uh, six grandchildren. <laughs> Being grandfather is one of my the best experiences I've ever had. Uh, uh, it's it's been great, and uh, it's a it's a real treasure to have neat grandchildren. I think one thing you get out of the academy, and you learn it pretty quickly, is there's a responsibility to give back, and I I don't know that just led on to the idea that, gee, we've been fortunate to be so successful in our business career, uh, now we need to do something to give back to the community. I've been very interested in the education arena for many years, so I support things like the Denver Inner City Parish, which has an inner city school, um, Alliance for Choice in Education, which also supports low-income kids in private schools, Colorado Uplift, which takes low-income kids and gives them mentors to help them develop and go on to college, uh, even though perhaps their family history wouldn't suggest that they can do that. And then, of course, through the Fox Family Foundation, we support a number of other nonprofits. A major thing for me, though, is the Air Force Academy, the, Air, the uh, USAFA Endowment. As I started to uh, go back to reunions and talk to my classmates, um, it became evident that the academy, as opposed to what a lot of people think, uh, doesn't have all the funds it needs to truly support the cadet excellence. And I think we provide a very valuable service to the academy and to the Air Force by being willing to step up and provide funding and moral support for all these great programs that are now able to happen as a result of uh, philanthropy. Oh, my reaction to the Well, I was, I was stunned. Uh, for one thing, I mean, when I saw the other two nominees this year, I thought, my goodness, I hope I can come up to part of their stature. So I was very happy for Steve Lorenz and uh, Alan McCarter. I'm just glad to be a part of this group. Uh, and uh, no, it's a great honor. I, I, I'm very grateful to the Academy and uh, to the selection committee. Do I feel good about my uh, contribution? Yeah, I do. I think I could have done more for sure. I think I've helped in some instances to get some stuff done and uh, I certainly feel that I want to give back for that experience that I've received uh, because that's, that's our legacy is what do we leave behind and uh, I think that's uh, been quite important for me. Ladies and gentlemen, we recognize John Fox, class of 1963. Mr. Fox, please join Superintendent Lieutenant General Jay Silveria and AOG President and CEO Marty Marcolongo and AOG Board Chair Kathy McLean on stage for the presentation of the Distinguished Graduate Medal. <laughs>
want to take a really long time tonight to tell you all <laughs> how much I appreciate this. Uh, I want to thank the Association of Graduates. Um, uh, you know, for some of us older grads, oh, Marty, um, it's past our bedtime. Uh, uh, there are so many people here to thank. Uh, uh, but since many of them are geezers like me, uh, that if I took the time to thank each of them, they might nod off and we'd ne never get through this. Uh, of course, we need our rest um, because um, by getting to bed early, we can uh, get up the next day and then our main job is to give advice to our superintendent on how to do his job. <laughs> Uh, seriously, I am very honored to walk in the footsteps of all these great distinguished graduates and, uh, and certainly all of you here who have served your uh, country so well. Um, I want to thank uh, my family, uh, uh, daughters uh, Anne, Kelly, and her friend Blake, my son Gregor, um, my grandchildren, Lily, Scarlett, Mary Sarah, and Peter, and finally, my lovely wife, Sandy. Thank you very much. Well, I, I was a Midwest um, uh, boy. I, I grew up in Webster Groves, Missouri. My father was a high school coach and uh, teacher, and my mother was a physical education teacher. So we had all, we had access to a lot of sports uh, when I grew up. I, did, I didn't know much about the Air Force Academy or anything in the military. You know. I'd been a Boy Scout, but that was about as close to a uniform as I'd, uh, as I'd gotten. Matt McDonald, who, who ran McDonald, uh, McDonald Aircraft, was a Princeton graduate. And he was encouraging me to go to Princeton. And uh, so I came back to seal the deal. He asked a guy by the name of Charlie Forsyth, who was a student of my father's in uh, high school years and years before, if he'd take me out to the McDonald plant. The uh, McDonald F-101 Voodoo was the hot airplane at the time. And so there was, there was a 101 standing there. I was just awestruck. So I scrambled up and jumped in the cockpit. And Charlie Forsyth said, that's when I knew I lost you. He said, I knew you were going to go to the Air Force Academy. <laughs> to show you how naive I was, I, I thought, well, I'll, I'll get out there early so I can look around <laughs> and see what the place is like. So I was one of the first buses to unload at the base of the ramp. And uh, oh my gosh, I, I had no idea what I was getting into. If you had your eyeballs moving at all, it was more push up. So I saw a lot of concrete uh, that day, very up close. I was playing on the JV squad and I, I was a walk-on. I, I was not a recruited athlete. So would, ben Martin, uh, our coach, well, he said, come on, suit up and come on up to Denver and, and be with the, the varsity. So that was a big deal for me. I mean, that was really cool. So I'm sitting there watching the game and, and we're getting beat up pretty good. And ben Martin turns over and says, Mac, get your helmet. You're going in the next, <laughs> next set of downs. What? I tell people I've completed uh, six for seven that day. Uh, three to Maryland and three to Air Force. Now, on Monday, uh, there was a blue jersey in my locker, which meant I was gonna suit up with the varsity. And so uh, that, that started it all. I actually ended up starting more games at quarterback as a, as a sophomore than I did uh, as a junior or senior. Uh, the honor code, I, th I think, was, was one of the pillars of uh, the Air Force Academy that really resonated with me. And, and, and it was because it was our honor code. It wasn't the, it wasn't the academy's honor code, it was ours, it was the cadets. We, we owned it, the cadet wing owned the honor code. And we were very zealous about, about protecting it and embracing it and, uh, and teaching uh, younger cadets about it. The, the ability to actually demonstrate leadership and to influence the lives of others, that was an important thing for me. Well, I, I went to pilot training, uh, went to Vance Air Force Base. Um, I married Grace uh, right after graduation in, in uh, July in the Cadet Chapel. 
and we headed off to Vance Air, Air Force Base. And uh, I didn't know how I was going to do in, in pilot training. We didn't have an air, you know, a flying program at the Air Force Academy, a soaring program or anything. But I, it was a, uh, like a duck taken to water. I, I, I loved it, absolutely loved it. Turned out I was a pretty good pilot. I got my pick of assignments and they had a couple of F-104s. And I can't think of a, of a better assignment for a young fighter pilot than to fly the F-104. I mean, it was exhilarating, and we did everything. We did air combat, we did, we actually strafed with a 20 millimeter gun, we fired sidewinders. We were down there for MiG protection out of, out of Cuba. And then we had uh, a good friend of mine came to the squadron, a young man uh, named uh, Pete Foley, and he had just completed an F-105 tour. And I thought, oh my gosh, the Vietnam War is gonna be over before I can get over there. And so, I left Homestead, Florida. I left this, this perfect assignment and volunteered to go to uh, Southeast Asia. And quite frankly, I enjoyed every minute of it. I often tell my classmate, Steve Ritchie, who feels the same way I did. I, I say, look, no, nobody likes warfare, but God, I loved combat. I mean, I loved it. I love flying combat missions. Flew a couple hundred of them and, and came back. And I thought my flying days were over. I went to Arizona State, got my degree, and, and went back to the Air Force Academy as, a, as an associate professor of engineering in the MEC department. My classmate, Nels Renning, uh, who had been there uh, at the Air Force Academy, he went on to fly with the Thunderbird team, and he says, you should, you should apply for the Thunderbird. I said, oh, Nels, I mean, I, I haven't been in an airplane now, I've been at grad school. He said, no, 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 no. He said, just, just put a package together and, and submit it. So I did. and. Uh, Damn, I got selected, so <laughs> I had to go into Phil Ertl and say, boss, um, <clears throat> I got selected for the Thunderbird team. He says, you just got here. And I said, yes, sir, I know. It was, it was uh, just, just under two years. We, we had, um, uh, had two, two very healthy boys, but we had, we had a little girl who had brain cancer. It turns that she needed some very, very special treatment. And so I told the, the flight surgeon, I said, if that's the case, I, I can't stay in the Air Force and have her someplace else being treated. So I resigned from the Air Force. And um, I, I, I don't regret a bit of it. I loved every minute in the Air Force, but I think I made the right decision. And we went to, we went to Memphis, Tennessee to get, get her treated at St. Jude's Children Research Hospital. And she lived till she was eight years old. She got great, great treatment there. And I've been close to the hospital ever since. And I've been on their professional advisory board and working hard to, to try to, to get corporate sponsorships, individual sponsorships, and to, and to brainstorm uh, the best, best ways forward. And then I met Fred Smith at Federal Express, and he said, Alan, I want you to come join Federal Express. And I said, Fred, I, I really don't want to be a pilot for Federal Express. I, that's not what I want to do. He said, no, 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 no. I want you to be a vice president. He says, you know how command posts work, and I want you to design a command post for Federal Express to tie the, the hub, the ground, and the air side together to coordinate all of that. When, when I got there, I had, I had 32 Falcon 20 aircraft, and when I left, I had over 500 airplanes. So it was, it was, a, it was a fun ride. But I, we were also uh, quite heavily involved, uh, believe it or not, in the possibility of commercial space transportation. And so I ended up being the, the chairman of the Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee here in Washington, D.C. I had about 100 people, and we wrote all the public policy for commercial space launch, which is still the way Elon Musk and everybody else, they still use those, those principles of, of commercial launch. Secretary Elizabeth Dole was Secretary of Transportation at the time. One day she said, Alan, I want you to be the FAA administrator. I said, Madam Secretary, you already have an FAA administrator. She said, yes, but he's getting ready to retire. He just doesn't know it yet. And I want, I want you to be the administrator. And literally that evening, the phone rang. Ms. McCart, yes, could you stand by for a call from the White House? White House. So <laughs> President Reagan gets on the line. Alan, this is your president. <laughs> yes, sir, Mr. President. I got a telephone in one hand, a salute in the other. <laughs> you know? He says, Liddy Dole tells me she needs you at the FAA. Yes, sir. He says, well, I need you on the team. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I ended up being FAA administrator. And so that was the last, the last two years of the Reagan administration. 
I'm quite proud of the things that we accomplished just in those two years. And then I got the itch to do something entrepreneurial. And I was studying the Wright Amendment out of Dallas Love Field. There was a part B that said if you fly an aircraft with a passenger capacity of 56 passengers or less, you can fly anywhere you want to in the world. And so I did. It was called Legend Airlines. Legend Airlines was wildly successful, so successful that our uh, opposing airlines decided we, we had to be eliminated. And so we couldn't raise the money to continue. We, we spent so much money in court that, that we really couldn't. So I had to fold that up. And just about, just about the time I started thinking about, well, now what? What's, what's the next adventure for me? Airbus called and said, we need a new head of North America and understand you're, you're available. Would you do that? And I said, I think that'd be terrific. So I joined as the, the chairman of Airbus North America. Then it was called North America. Now it's called Airbus America. I've been on the board of the National Air and Space Museum. Certainly enjoy that. I, I try to participate in those boards or associations that can create better understanding of our industry and bring people together. And we find that when we do that, we, we have a lot in common, uh, a lot more in common than we have not in common. It's been a, a really interesting career. I've, I've, been, had the good, I've had the good fortune of being around aviation for the entire time. So I, I consider myself a very, very fortunate. I didn't, I didn't just go with one company and stay with one company forever, but I got a chance to be with a lot of different experiences, and I, w I, wouldn't, I wouldn't trade any of it. In fact, I, I envy the young people coming into our industry now of all of the opportunities that they, that they now have. The, the best truly is yet to come. Well, I was stunned. I, I was very honored. Um, like I say, I, I, I'm privileged to be part of a class that, that had, not only has five other DGs, but several more that could easily be distinguished graduates. And to be recognized with them uh, and the other distinguished graduates is really quite an honor and, and, and I'm very humbled by that. I owe a great deal to the Air Force Academy. Uh, my experiences there uh, have, have meant a great deal to me. And I often tell people, you know, collegiate sports prepared me for combat and combat prepared me for corporate life. But, uh, uh, but it's true. The, the, the sense of teamwork, the reliance on others, and giving it all was exactly what you needed in combat. And so uh, I would say the lessons I learned at the Air Force Academy were, were spot on. I've always, I've always told myself, and my motto, if you will, is never come out of afterburner. So uh, I figure you, just, you go as fast as you can, as hard as you can, as long as you can. And there's always going to be a tanker out there someplace that, that, that you can hit, but, but never throttle back. Just keep, keep moving as hard as you can. Ladies and gentlemen, we recognize Mr. Alan McCarter, class of 1964. Mr. McCarter, please join General Silveria, Marty Marcolongo, and Kathy McLean on stage for the presentation of the Distinguished Graduate Medal. Thank you very much. I, I, I feel very, very honored. I feel very humble uh, to be considered a distinguished graduate, especially with, uh, with John and Steve uh, in your company. Uh, it, it's really a privilege. And I, I want to start by thanking uh, my wife, Gracie. Uh, Gracie's been by my side through all kinds of interesting and exciting career experiences. And uh, I've been really blessed with uh, her partnership, and with a great family, uh, my son Scott and Andy, and then their great wives, uh, Jessica and uh, Lexi, and our five grandkids. And then, as you saw, with the uh, uh, lessons and courage from a little girl about 40 years ago. 
And thanks to a blind date on Dooley Christmas, <laughs> that's where it all started. And Gracie and I have been together ever, ever since. Uh, it's the best thing that ever happened to me for sure. I want to thank um, several of my classmates uh, from 1964. And uh, it was made mention of those who have been parked underneath the stairwell over here. Raise your hands, my friends. These, these guys are not only good friends, they're, they're my best friends. Um, they're, they're teammates, they're roommates, they're flying squadron mates, uh, they're warriors. I am very honored to represent uh, them in this class uh, as a distinguished graduate. And as you know, and as was mentioned, there are five other class of 64 graduates that are distinguished graduates, and I feel very honored to be a part of that group. The Academy, as I mentioned in, this, in the video, has had a profound effect on me personally and has shaped my personality and my sense of values. Um, many of you, as, as has been stated, uh, would mention things like uh, your self-confidence and courage and integrity and honor and commitment and perseverance, competitiveness, and yes, well, me too. That's exactly how I feel. The Academy was the crucible for these things and, and many, many more. Uh, several Academy leaders had a significant impact on me. Uh, people like Coach Ben Martin, uh, Jim Comboy, uh, we had um, uh, Jim Bowman, Sergeant Bill Coltrane, many of you remember, and especially my mentor, Phil Earl. And these guys, right over there, under the stairwell, uh, developed my and shaped my pursuit of excellence. So Gracie and I have been married almost 54 years now. We have a common uh, uh, theme together that the best things in life are not things. So I thank you, my good friends. I thank you, my classmates. Thank you, Gracie. It's an honor to be a distinguished graduate. So Gracie, you cover the distinguished half and I'll be the graduate. <laughs> thank you. In uh, 1960, when I was a fourth grader and nine years old, my dad was stationed at Lowry Air Force Base in Denver, Colorado, going through training, and he drove me down here. And the academy was still, uh, it was mostly finished, but like the chapel wasn't even started yet and was under construction. I saw the Air Force Academy, and being nine, I don't know what it happened, but I fell immediately in love with the school. And for the next eight years, we moved eight times. I went to uh, eight different schools, including four high schools. But I kept my focus on one thing, that someday I was gonna become a cadet at the United States Air Force Academy. And on 23 June, 1969, I was blessed in that I was accepted into the class, the illustrious class of 1973, I was in 15 Squadron, Cadet Squadron 15. We called ourselves Marching Military 15. I had a lot of great classmates, a lot of upperclassmen, like for instance, the class of 1970. They were my firsties. Uh, I've never forgotten them. They helped shape my life. And everyone, I think, even today, is shaped by when you're duly, by your firsties. They still do it today, but in those days, we used to count and say, Sir, there are 1,330 days to graduation. I would get depressed as the days go on because I had achieved my life goal. And the two magic letters that got me through this school was EI, extra instruction. And I have more EI sessions than probably just about anybody who ever graduated from that school. When I was studying hard there, when I'd get demotivated, I would take the this brochure on the ring and I would taped it to the front of my desk and on uh, and, and the wall in front of my desk and I would look at it and remember this is why I'm here to earn this ring to be a member of the long blue line it, it meant so much to me that's why to this day I wear the ring not to be a ring knocker but I'm proud of this ring that it took so much to earn and that this school 
and being a member of my class, the illustrious class of 73, helped shape and make me who I am. I was pilot qualified and 85% of my class went to pilot training. And so I went off to pilot training with my classmates. I went to Selma, Alabama, Craig Air Force Base, and uh, slugged my way through pilot training. And so I became a pilot, and, uh, and I eventually got to fly, uh, during a 37-year career, 10 different types of aircraft. But my primary aircraft at the time was the KC-135. And as I like to say, KC-135s have been very, very good to me. So I graduate from pilot training. I go off to Ellsworth Air Force Base in Rapid City, South Dakota. I didn't even know where Ellsworth Air Force Base was. And I met, I started dating my wife. There's a long story on that, Leslie. And uh, I married my best friend. It's the best thing ever happened to me. We started our journey together. Leslie and I were, uh, moved 13 times while we were in the Air Force. Every assignment, the, the vast majority of the ones that I got in the Air Force, were that, that stretched me and made me who I am today are the ones I didn't want. They made me the Japan Desk Officer and Chief of Northeast Asia Branch and the J-5 in, in Washington, D.C. And this is what I knew about Japan, okay? But I grew and got better and better at it as I stayed and served in that assignment. Speedy Martin, class of 70, one of my firsties, he was in the same squadron, called me and I was his Director of Plans and Programs in USAFE, the United States Air Forces in Europe. And he said, tomorrow we're going to announce that you're going to be the Air Force Director of the Budget. What do you think about that? And I said, sir, I'd rather be a commander. He said, that's not in the cards now. So on September 15, 2001, literally four to five days after the planes hit the building, I showed up at the Pentagon. The smoke was still in the building. And they made me the Air Force Director of the Budget. I never, in four years as director of the budget, got an orientation of the director of the budget. But I learned the hard way. I knew I could do it because of the training and education that I received here at the United States Air Force Academy. I was fortunate to be selected to become Commandant of Cadets here at the Air Force Academy from 1996 to 1999. Uh, what a wonderful assignment. And I got to hang out with 5,000, over 5,000 uh, bright, young, shiny teenagers that were growing who are now, the la large number of them are lieutenant colonels and colonels, and they're serving our country well. I learned as much from them as they learned from me. The Air Force, in their infinite wisdom, sent me to be the uh, commander of Air University in Montgomery, Alabama. Another great assignment where I hung out with a lot of great young academics, uh, professional officers, civilians, uh, who just taught me so much. And then I went on there after that uh, to become the commander of air education and training command and then retired seven years ago. The things I learned at the academy and the things that I learned from the faculty, and I say that again and again, and, I, and, and the AOCs and the coaches stayed with me throughout my career and helped me become a better instructor and a mentor and a leader for all these young Americans. Bard Holiday called me one day. I'd never even met Mr. Holiday. A class of 65, wonderful, wonderful person, and uh, he asked me if I'd consider coming here. So I took over the job in May of 11, and I got to meet a lot of great people that care very much about the school. All of these, I call them disparate groups, not desperate, disparate groups, who are here to do one thing, to help certain aspects of the academy and to the cadets, and to help the cadets grow and expand so they become great leaders for America and great leaders for our Air Force. Back in 1987, when I became the commander of the 93rd Air Refueling Squadron in uh, Castle Air Force Base, one night we were doing an operational readiness inspection. And in spare moments, I'd write down points of leadership that I had learned over time. None of them were original with me. I've been blessed to work with great people. And so I started using them as principles that I taught my squadron and then my groups and then my wings all the way through. And so the biggest thing about my book, Lorenz on Leadership, is not about the book itself. It's about stories about airmen. And it's easy to write about them because they're the ones who are making the difference. I've been invited to be, uh, speak at uh, the prep school, uh, at different cadet squadrons. The biggest thing I tell them is, Never, ever, ever give up. A measure of a person's success is not what they actually accomplish. 
The measure of a person's success is the adversity they overcome. And everybody has adversity. No one is without adversity. And so you just keep showing up and taking the two by fours in the face and dusting yourself off and keep moving forward and serving this great nation and serving our great Air Force. I was blessed that I got to go to the Air Force Academy. I was blessed that I got to serve in the United States Air Force for over 37 years and to get to hang out with such great airmen all over the world. I was blessed that I got to serve something bigger than myself. And I just want to say thanks to the United States Air Force Academy and the faculty and the AOCs and the coaches and the leaders for letting me have that chance and opportunity. And as I said before, I'd do it all again. Ladies and gentlemen, we recognize General Stephen Lorenz, class of 1973. General Lorenz, please join General Silveria, Marty Marcolongo, and Kathy McLean here on the stage for the presentation of your medal. I have the slides for Lorenz and leadership, but I'd like to, okay. Now, first of all, I, uh, I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank my family. They're sitting here, my lovely spouse of 42 years. Uh, I want to thank my grandfather, uh, who uh, in enlisted in 1918 and dropped bombs on the battleship Ostfriedland and with Billy Mitchell in 1921, and my father who uh, is 93 years old and served for uh, 33 years in the Air Force and retired as the wing commander at Chanute in Illinois. Uh, I, I, as I said in the film, uh, God, I love this school. And thank you for letting me go to this school. It was the best thing ever happened to me besides, of course, Marine Leslie and my three children. <laughs> thank you. Oh. And thank you for letting me be a member of the illustrious class of 1973. <laughs> yeah. Folks, what great stories. How about a round of applause for all three of our new distinguished graduates? And as we wrap up tonight's events, uh, we'll invite the members of the classes of 1963, 1964, and 1973 to come forward for a group photo alongside your class's winners um, after we're done. Um, let me offer our thanks to the entire AOG staff for putting this great event together, as well as the, the staff of the Falcon Club for catering tonight's meal. How about a round of applause? And in his citation um, for this award, General Lorenz is cited for having 29,000 copies of Lorenz on leadership. Um, here's a little known fact. If you've ever had discussions with him, um, he said he's been known to go to the trunk of his car and pull out a copy to present each and every person with a copy. So I'm convinced there are actually 28,000 copies in the trunk of his car. But let me offer my thanks to each and every one of you. This is a tremendous night uh, for you to come celebrate the achievements of these three great men and also to celebrate uh, Founders Day for our great Air Force Academy. So let me offer um, these final thoughts. Drive carefully and have a great evening. And we're gonna end tonight with the Air Force song. <laughs> Off we go into the wild blue yonder. Thank you.
Thank <laughs> you.